Stories invite us into the liminal space where we discover new possibilities for healing and transformation. They link us together in our common humanity and shared values. Stories are magic. They emerge and breathe in the mystery and become the fullness of who we are in each moment of life's journey. Narrative therapy and community work, originated by Michael White and David Epstein, is a respectful way to help people embody their preferred stories of living and imagine new possibilities for the future. The Narrative Collaborative is a group of therapists, counselors, community workers, helpers and healers, deeply committed to narrative principles and practices, including creating safe spaces where stories come alive and individuals, families, and communities are honored as the experts in their own lives. In this space, the storyteller is centered in the conversation and claims all rights to their own narrative. In the spring of 2022, some of us started planning our annual retreat. This year was different. We would gather in person for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic. This year was also different because Ryan would bring indigenous ceremonies and talking circles to the gathering. I jumped at the chance to film it. I learned from Ryan that his people believe sacred ceremonies should not be documented. My mission then became making a documentary film without documenting. Making a film that honors the traditional practices of indigenous peoples and the storyteller rights of everyone at the gathering. As I soon discovered, it was the stories we told in the circles and at the breakfast table that would link us together and transport us to new landscapes of meaning and possibilities for truth and reconciliation. Iffy and Roger hosted the gathering at Iffy's house in what is now commonly known as Maine. The indigenous peoples of the Wabanaki Confederacy named this territory Dawnland for the rising sun over its eastern shore. Before everyone arrived, when Roger couldn't find the big tent, we looked over the yard to see where we could set up a couple of portable shelters. But even side by side, they weren't big enough to hold our circle. We needed something else. Then I discovered the pergola. Another name for pergola is sanctuary. Roger and I started moving chairs into the space, but realized it needed a cover to protect us from sun and rain. We hunted around the barn, found several tarps and jerry-rigged them with bungee cords. With the help of Grace and Caitlin, we put the finishing touches on what would become our sacred space for the gathering. When I arrived on Sunday, you were busy trying to find a tent. <laughs> and, I was busy trying to find a tent. And we, we had this, I think, really wonderful 
uh, adventure together, trying to be part of creating this sacred space, if you will, where the circle would meet. So I, I I volunteered to come and help if you get things together here because I didn't think she could kind of get everything prepared. And um, we put up bookshelves and we hung things and we did various things, right? And But the tent we left to the last minute because, you know, we put it up last year and then we couldn't find it. So that was not good. And then... Um, I was probably freaking out a little bit, but I did, I did bring it up not to get completely freaked out, but, but you had some ideas about, you know, how do we create a space with a pergola that will work well, you know, and, and we collaborated in putting some tarps up on it to help it be not waterproof, but perhaps a little bit rain resistant. <laughs> and, um, and, and of course it became a space that people immediately accommodated to I, I i don't know that anybody's said too much about it but but i mean people just started living there for the last few days right it has been the circle the sacred circle for days and that was your vision and our work together that c created that it was it was a wonderful collaborative process of shifting gears to like what's your second choice if you can't find what you need it's kind of like field of dreams you build it and they will come <laughs> <laughs> and did they know that it was always there or what that it wasn't always there i guess right but when we set up the pergola and people used it i don't know you know we're, we're setting up the staging you know for whatever's going to happen you know you can you you, you can have great conversations but you know we're, we're just trying to put in the things that make people comfortable mm -hmm from which to build whatever will those experiences that are going to happen right yeah yeah yeah, yeah so we have a fire in the fireplace we all sit around there there's an experience that will happen yeah you know yeah and, uh, so we were putting in place some of the building blocks that people would lean on maybe before the opening ceremony ryan set up an altar he shared some teachings of his people, stories about reclaiming indigenous ceremonies from the ravages of colonialism, and the importance of creating a safe and sacred space for each person to speak their truth. It's a reclamation, a lot of the stuff that's on this table. Uh, reclaiming things that uh, were taken away because of colonialism. And uh, part of my journey is turning back to the traditions and reclaiming some of that and, and bringing it back to life and bringing it back to the people um, and creating safe spaces to learn and talk about these things because my knowledge is actually fragmented. People have elders and as we lose our elders it's like losing a library and, and so traditionally I would seek those elders out to gain that knowledge and because we've lost a lot of elders we lose a lot of that knowledge and wisdom and so so a lot of this is uh um step by step over the how old am i 39 so it's been you know around a decade of, of collecting these things and learning about them yeah. Yeah. so in my journey of learning some of these things you know my background is anishinaabe soto people and because of my disconnection from there in my journey into this healing stuff, I, I connected through the Nahiwe, the Cree people. And they have this concept of Wakotuin, uh, the doctrine uh, of the kinship between all living things, plants, rocks, animals, humans, everything. It's cyclical. Every time you kind of go around the sun, it's, an, it's a new journey, right? And each time I, we go around, I learn new things. All the, the teachings of the four directions every season uh, and the knowledge that I gain from my own lived experiences and how I've learned from elders how to render out wisdom from knowledge and experiences. I may be um, kind of like a facilitator of the circle, like we're all equal and we all have a voice and we all get to share uh, what we're going through, what's on our mind, and you know, these circles have uh, different purposes. 
and our purpose is to come together, gather together, and um, learn from each other. But from from my experience and, and learning these protocols and processes, we have to know each other to be able to learn from each other, and that's the first step. And we're going to do that. Quickly. One of the things I really want to share with you is about the process and protocol of, of smudging. Like I was saying earlier, I didn't come into contact with these things so much later in my life. And traditionally, I would have learned these things much earlier, around, you know, 12, 13. But because of colonialism and what happened in Turtle Island, North America, uh, those things were outlawed. They were taken away from Indigenous people. And so it happened much later in life. But one of the ways that I came into contact with this stuff was through a lot of the work that I did with an organization in Alberta. And so I was introduced to uh, the sweat lodge, sundance, pipe ceremonies, naming ceremonies. And a part of every one of these ceremonies is smudging, it's cleansing. But through some work I did in the correctional system, one of the elders there taught me about what sm the act of smudging is. It's like informed consent. So when we smudge today, we're basically saying that we consent to be here together. I understand what we're doing and taking part in. And uh, so, so that's one of the things we'll be doing today. As you can see, there's a number of medicines and things like that uh, present today. And I have um, one medicine for each direction. Different cultures use it in different ways, but I have tobacco for the east, I have sweetgrass for the south, sage for the west, and cedar for the north. And these directions also provide, it's like a model of teaching culture that I'm from. The east is for children, it's spiritual growth and spiritual enlightenment. And the south is kind of like adolescence, adulthood kind of. The west is kind of middle age and the north is um elderhood and so that's their cycle of life and each of these medicines have different teachings associated with them and i'm trying to represent the whole community the whole individual and having them all present yeah and you know different colors like uh east is yellow south is red west is black and the north is white and, and the reason the north is white because the elders right here, and I see a lot of that around. Yeah, so that's cool. So that's cool. And and you know, um, it, it's one it's one of these things that we have. We seek elders for their knowledge. And as I was explaining earlier, whenever you want to seek knowledge, make an offering, spiritual exchange. When I learned about um, smudging as informed consent, I brought that elder cake. And, and at the time, I didn't, I was just learning. She said, bring me some cake. And I was like, okay. So I went and got some cake. She heard about a party. And um, I brought her cake back. And that's when I started part of my education. Because I learned that it, that information came to me because I brought her cake. So so anytime you want to receive something, take an offering. We'll be using a talking piece today. So, and they come in different forms. We can use a feather, a talking stick, or a talking rock. And there's a certain protocol around that where if you're the individual who has the talking piece, it's your right. You have a right to speak. And I use that in capital letters. Um, and everyone else's responsibility is to listen. And so that, that person is kind of like the person at that moment. And everyone's tuned into them. And so these uh, these circles can be quite interesting. I was I was in one that took three weeks in time. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, we did a lot of a lot of rounds, and it was about healing your inner child wounds. And uh, so we went one week, five days, and we took a break for two days. Came back, did everyone's story. Did you know we kept going around like that? And by the end of it, it's like you know we were ready for some not healing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I've been in some of these circles as well where um, an elder has a lot to say and, and you'll be there and you'll be there. 
and you'll be there <laughs> until they're done. And, uh, that's part of the protocols and the rules around these things. The opening ceremony created a safe and sacred space within the lodge for each of us to be vulnerable. I invited folks to reflect on their experience. Stories started doing their magic by linking us together and transporting us to new landscapes of meaning. Michael White always talks about honoring, um, but also ceremonies are honoring. I think that uh, Ryan has brought forward to me the idea of ceremony and honoring of presence. Uh, for me, uh, yesterday's ceremony was a safe space to swim naked, to be vulnerable, and to be vulnerable with another group of people to me some of the most precious. Uh, experiences that I think that we have as human beings. We're going to do it In my experience of culture, we don't often have that level of vulnerability. And there is something about being together and it being a ceremony and being with people who are willing to be open as well. Right? That's a gift. That is my favorite part of being a human being. One of the immediate things that it got me thinking about is, is some of the rituals and ordinances that I have as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, uh, you know, and the, there was an altar in the middle of us and we were in a circle. And uh, it, was, it was something that uh, we were all associated in, but it was all uh, individual consent. It's the smudging over my, over my head and uh, my ears and uh, my breathing in and in my in my heart and then being able to hear everybody's story i could look at every single person in that circle as they told their stories including ryan and said i i had some sort of a a linkage which each with each one of those people Abby and I were talking about this the other day and about that there's some some link with linkages that are immediately apparent that that look very very similar with the ceremony that we went through uh like seeing the the smoke going up like in the in the temple there was uh incense that was burnt that was eh, that was going up as a representation of of prayers going forward and there was you know, even further out, there was just uh, always just such a connection back to ancestors that looks very familiar, you know, and it just, you know, the more that we see that and then the more that like Ryan and I have talked off and on informally, I just, somebody I've never met before, but I can feel my heart being knit more and more and more to him. I, I am a settler on specifically uh, lower Tanana Dene lands. I just feel like I sh should be connecting with the people who know that land and are still uh, custodians of that land. Knit with that is, is that I know that there's things that I can learn that, from them that I don't know as part of my uh, European American culture and so that's that's incredibly helpful in helping me to kind of not just as a therapist but as a human being to move forward in my life and enjoy you know the the richness of, of what we have here when ryan uh passed that stone around for all of us to talk he, he took his time to explain what a, a talking stone or a talking stick why it is that they have it and uh, what is kind of the the procedures that around that and I immediately go to that because he had said that everybody respectfully listens 
not just gives them the space and kind of waits until they're done talking, but they really listen to what they have to say until they pass that that stone on. For me, that that's part of the truth and rec reconciliation, particularly the, the truth part of it. There may be times when it, it comes, those conversations, they come up against something where I, I all of a sudden realize, oh, I have some of my own racism that I'm not aware of and my own colonialism I'm not aware of. And if, if that person either literally or proverbially has a stone still in their hand, uh, it's important for me not to just shut up, but to, to also listen. And then like the second part of that kind of goes back to what you were asking earlier about um, overlap in traditions, you know, particularly with my Latter-day Saint traditions is that we have a tradition that um, there are particular stones that are very important in being able to see things. And so I, I would hope with this very special stone that um, that Ryan brought that, you know, that will help me and in, <clears throat> you know, in the broader terms will help us to see things that weren't seen before, that we'll be able to have the, the visions that and the dreams that we need to, to be able to, to at least to start to heal. The whole ceremony itself felt very powerful to me. I have been told my whole life that I have Native American in me. I've always been interested in um, canoeing and kayaking and grew up playing in the trees. Like I, I've always felt connected to nature and so many things, but then have had this like unproductive societal narrative I don't have a 16th in me, so I have no Native American like lineage. I have been told that I have this and no ability to prove it. So it has been kind of like a longing or claiming for me being able to be a part of something traditionally only or mostly um, indigenous peoples participate in was was really beautiful. And I felt very honored to to be a part of that. And then I spoke to Ryan a little bit about it. And he was like, you don't, you don't need a 23 me test. Like whether there's no blood or a lot of your blood, like you can claim that and you can connect to that. Him giving me that permission was super liberating for me. I don't know why it mattered that Ryan like accepted me or like gave me permission, but him doing that, um, it just kind of like opened the door for like, a lot of other things that I don't think I've really been accepting or allowing myself to like do or believe or claim kind of on the opposing end. It was like, I don't need someone to tell me that I can be who I believe I am. For me, the opening ceremony was I mean, a number of things all at once um, in the sense that uh, I'm kind of an interloper in this group. It's a very welcoming group. And of course, I've known my my father for as long as I've been alive. I've known the work of narrative therapy um, kind of by proxy. It's it's interesting. I've realized uh, that I can I can quote little lines that you, you know, little slogans, um, you know, the absent but implicit, you yeah. know, copies that originate. You know, I was yeah. reading with, with Iffy about this a little bit and it's, uh, I've had a sort of uh, an informal education, I guess, in some some of the the narrative ideas and narrative work. The thing that sort of stands out to me the most, you know, is um, and maybe this is a the thing that kind of like makes the the Western mind like, turn its head a little bit. Um, it's just the idea that what we're doing is a medicine ceremony, you know, and that what he's using are medicines. And we think of medicines as uh, substances that we ingest and they have a chemical reaction in our body and they heal sage and sweetgrass and cedar and tobacco, uh, you know, when they're, when they're burned and used for smudging, it's a different idea of what a medicine does. Um, it's a collective um, social 
use of medicine. So I think that's something that's stuck with me um, that I've thought about. And I wonder if it will change my understanding of what medicine is and does going forward. And, and listening to Josh say medicine, to have that many people care for you, genuine interest is medicine. The thing that stood out for me was um, the drum um, and um, the heartbeat and uh, the sense that I had, uh, I, I don't want to go too mystical about it, but that it was uh, pre-verbal. It was, uh, it was uh, as we come into life uh, feeling. Uh, as if, you know, sort of as if uh, uh, a, a, a child is in the mother's womb, sort of a sense of heartbeat and knowing that heartbeat. And for me, that uh, sort of uh, connection that precedes language, uh, that, that came to me in a kind of a powerful way. The second thing that really stood out for me it was uh, the honoring, uh, the slowing it way down uh, to the point of waiting for uh, the last person to show up. We all have to be here or we can't start. And then as you start, everyone is with that person <laughs> until their story is told then we're with that person till their story is told. And it wasn't about responding to people's stories. It was about honoring people's stories. We all did it together and it went beyond listening. Ken, what made it possible for you to come to this awakening or understanding of beyond listening? Yeah, awakening is a good word. <laughs> yeah, I was talking, I was just kind of joking about how much I've had to unlearn. Uh, this is an unlearning for me, you know, it's a stepping into something more than what I'm used to in my own practices and language and understanding and an individualistic world, you know. Uh, so it, it takes me somewhere. It's a, it's a kind of transport. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it shines a light on that which uh, listening is not quite this. When Ryan created that space, a couple of things stood out to me. One was how gentle the space became and how automatically honoring as soon as we did the cleansing, the clearing, the smudging, um, and how attentive everyone was. You know, like often in those spaces, you can be thinking about, well, what am I going to say? I don't think that happened. Everyone was so present through the whole thing. Um, how much healing happened in that circle. Right off the bat, the very first time we got together, people are sharing in this deeply healing way. Um, and there's a, a, a power in this group that I love that is absent in one-on-one -on -one therapy that um, I would love to see brought back in, but not as group therapy, but more as healing circles. I know one of my favorite things was throughout this whole healing circle, there was this little mockingbird and he was so close to the circle. He was in the bush right behind whoever was sitting on that side of the thing. He was within two and a half feet the whole time. And he was quiet. I mean, mockingbirds are not quiet. <laughs> he was quiet the whole time. And it was just so beautiful how he stayed present pretty much the whole thing. And because I got to go first, I got to sort of be aware of his presence as well as the presence of all the people. And uh, that just felt like a little blessing to me. I really loved it. And it was good. I, personally, it was really good because I tend to talk too much. I tend to be like a mockingbird. You know? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And he just listened. I'm like, thank you for that lesson. You know, just to, just to be still and listen. And uh, 
So yeah, I guess the long and short of it is I just want more. You know what strikes me is the absence of shame. Like there is an, a little bit of potentially inherent shame in one-on-one -on -one because we have to keep it private. And and to Caitlin's point, I mean, there's sometimes it has to be private. It's not safe yet. And, and safe safety needs to be experienced and created and shared before you can do this. So I, I wouldn't necessarily jump the gun, but I think in our culture, we've, we've, we've shamed so much of experience and we've othered so much of experience, including experience of psychosis that could actually be visions, could actually be just a different way of knowing and could actually be psychosis. But, but, you know, we've, we've made it so that people have to tell their stories privately. And to me, there's an intrinsic shaming possibility in that it's not it's not inevitable but it's a possibility in that and whereas a community of support i mean even thinking about something as terrible as sexual violence and sexual trauma having to put that in privacy on the one hand is safer on the other hand the accountability remains with the victim it's a collective responsibility when these types of violent acts are committed, you know, whether it's child abuse or, you know, sexual violence or physical violence, domestic violence, whatever it is, um, and probably even addiction, you know, is just held. The, the lack of connection is what I hear so often from folks, you know, so could we as a community hold people and hold one another, then maybe not even need so much of this pathologizing, individualized treatment. Between the ages of 10 and 17 and a half or so, I lived in South Africa, where there's just, it's all othered, you know? And, uh, and you, you come away from that carrying white privileges with a lot of guilt and shame, and but, but paralyzed to know what to do with that. You know, it really has held me in its grip. And, um, and I remember being really attacked by, you know, a person of color when I was doing a divestment march. You know, you're just expiating your white guilt. And I mean, I guess there's truth in that, but it sort of leaves you not having a place to stand, not knowing how to, you know, participate in hoping for better things. There's a lot in Native American culture as as you know i'm an, i'm ignorant really of the depth of it but there's a lot of it that feels really right to my heart and uh the spiritual connection with the land and the beings of the land and the you know the trees and is what feels really close to my heart and so if there was a way that i could participate in that and and actually celebrating that and paying respect to that not appropriating it, but actually really lifting it up. Like, hey, we could learn some stuff. You know what I mean? You know, there's so much wisdom here that we've tried to rub out. And so, you know, can we just respect it, actually, and be humble enough to, you know, just listen? You know, like the mockingbird. Like the mockingbird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if the, if the mockingbird had said something to you, what might she have said? Hmm. Well, I guess it was interesting what, what just came up. It's kind of powerful. It was, you have a right to be here. You know, you have a right to be um, part of a circle, part of a healing, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, and I think that's, thank you for that shouldn't actually because that's helping things go deeper yeah <laughs>
The naming experience during this journey is fluid. It's the opposite of labeling or nailing down identity. Ryan and I had many conversations during and after the gathering. We explored his cultural understanding of the power of storytelling, the way stories connect us to each other, and the real effects of colonialism on his identity journey. When I hear the word story, I also associate it with a data set. When elders will share a story, there's not really an intention of teaching a specific lesson, but imparting a data set that you can then use throughout your entire life. And you can always return to that data set and, and get new wisdom and, and different knowledge from that. And there's all kinds of different stories. There's lived experiences, there's uh, family stories, there's tribal stories, there's nation stories, there's spirit stories stories that have been passed down and passed down for centuries, we gain those data sets. And that's, it, that's cultural perpetuity. This identity journey is not necessarily linear and traditionally psycholo traditional psychology, uh, but the image comes up for me is this spiral, upward kind of spiral and how resilience might play into that. It's the same motion that all of our planets and all of our suns and stars that are going through is that circular motion. And as it moves through space, it creates a spiral. All the astronomers know it. And our ancestors before modern science, they knew that. And so every time we go around the sun, we're, we're, we're back at the same point, but further along in our journey. You know, I was quickly getting some answers once I became connected to some of these ceremonies, uh, sharing circles, talking circles, uh, healing circles, and the sweat lodge and, and other things. Um, and I think that was initially for me, you know, because I was in a place that wasn't so great. Uh, what I started to realize is that part of this is connection to others, because other people are going through all kinds of stuff too. And, you know, in the knowledge and wisdom that was shared with me from elders, what I started to see, recognize is that, oh, like, not only am I benefiting uh, from my wellness from being connected to ceremony and elders, um, other people can benefit from that, too, that maybe don't have that connection right now. Because um, a lot of uh, Indigenous people are dislocated from their culture from their communities from their nations and i think that they're you know part of that journey is is going back to that and and how do you do that it's very you know there's no manual for that there's no not too many instructions and so in my journey i i, I meet people and so that's just become a part of it along the way some of these other things have come up around uh, truth and reconciliation because um, there's a relationship in Turtle Island between uh, the European settlers and indigenous people that it, you know, hasn't gone that well. Truth first and reconciliation. And how do you do that? But in relationship. And so that journey started to expand a bit. And so in my other relationships with people that aren't of descent of uh, indigenous ancestry, um, there's these spaces that I'm trying to create so that knowledge can be shared about those relationships and um, the colonization that's gone on. Yeah. I asked Ryan about the tactics of colonialism on Turtle Island. This question animated a multi-storied conversation about the impact of modern power on individuals, families, and cultures, and the discovery of some counter practices to these tactics. I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, there are so many distinct 
indigenous nations in Turtle Island. There are there's overlap culturally speaking, but there's also so many differences and understandings. And I'm just again one voice that um, is kind of coming from a, a particular understanding based on the teachings that I've received and been connected to. The uh, tactics and and the program or the 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 project of colonization, you know, it's so, um, there's so many different things that have happened. I probably couldn't speak to them all, but, um, you know, it was definitely intentional. It wasn't an accident. It, it was part of a, a, a bigger process to, uh, I think, gain control of the resources on Turtle Island. There was a lot of deceit, lies, false treaty making. When you think about the residential schools and the 60s scoop and um, the Indian agents and these formal pol government policies, uh, it seeks compliance and control. One of the things that was also done was that there was an imposition of, of you know, other ways within communities on reservations, the social structure and the family structures and the tribal structures, there's an attempt at destroying them. And there's a lot of damage done. I remember when I started really working on First Nations, I assumed that what the, the coloniza colonization was trying to impose their culture on the First Nations people. And what I quickly realized is that was that was not accurate. They weren't imposing a European culture. They were they were imposing uh, obedience. All the propaganda out there about hey let's civilize the Indian was a lot. And I am quite careful about how I say this because I think Indigenous people are really putting a lot of effort into healing and reclaiming and repairing and self-determining. But the policies haven't changed. If these governing bodies really wanted to make change, they would change the policies, you know, and, and they haven't. Like what, what happened in Wet'suwet'en, the military-like response that the RCMP did to protect the interests of the pipelines. And, and I'm not making any comment politically on, on pipelines. I'm simply commenting on the response. And then you look on the East Coast, the, the response that the RCMP had to the indigenous lobster fisheries. It's there in black and white in the treaty. Indigenous people over here, the Mi'kmaq and the Malasi, you know, they have a hereditary right to make earn a living wage. The authorities over here sat and watched civilians burn down a lobster pound. And they did nothing to stop it, to prevent it. You know, a lot of the words and language around either side of this, they're just words. So when, when you hear the word First Nation, that to many people is just a phrase or a word. But that has a very deep, deep meaning and and jurisdictional international jurisdictional implications that to 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 most people is just that's just a label when we're talking about a first nation, we're talking about a sovereign nation that means a lot, and so if that's the context we're talking about, a treaty is a nation to nation relationship, and that means something. It's not just the word. And in my process of reclamation, these things stop being just words. There was a time in my life where I definitely had internalized the oppressor and the oppression and identified as white, Canadian. Moving to Beaver Hills, which is colonial Edmonton, I started to have different connections to my indigenousness. 
but even in that process, there was still a lot of fear, guilt, and shame. Even though I was going to sweat lodges and pipe ceremonies, I was still struggling with my identity and reclamation with one particular side of my family that is um, Euro Canadian. My process of reclamation was viewed as throwing indigenousness in their faces. So just my existence and my acknowledgement of my indigenousness was problematic and inconvenient. That really kind of created a wedge, which, I mean, when you look at the colonial playbook, that's exactly what, what they're after. I think that's one of the, one of the main tactics is this divide between Indigenous people and, and the rest of everyone in Turtle Island. Because that can continue to happen if, if we're kind of inhuman. If I'm human, I don't think a lot of the stuff that's going on happens. If it's not just this narrative that I'm hearing in the media or shared amongst friends and family, and I'm human, and I have a name, and I have a story, and there's details in it, um, I think the actions that are taken against Indigenous people, the ongoing colonialism, it's seen for the truth of what it is. This conversation with Ryan took me to an early coming out story. It was 1978, several years after the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. It was also the year Harvey Milk, the first openly gay elected official in the United States, was assassinated. Harvey was an inspiration to me. He called upon all of us to come out in spite of the risks because he understood that if people really know you, it's harder to other you. What outrage does and anger does as a counter kind of measure or counter practice, it's a standing up. It's like, I'm not going to allow this to happen anymore. It's almost like an awakening. I do think it's necessary. It is very difficult and, and it can be um, challenging to experience that emotion uh, and with all the realizations of what happened. I don't know in the long run how, how long we can sustain outrage. I started asking the question, okay, like moving beyond this, like what things can I do? There are so many barriers in place and things to maintain that uh, power and control, how do you effectively come up against that? How do you change that? Yeah. And, and I think we see the spirit in that in truth and reconciliation. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is that it's truth first and, and awareness first. We have to be in that truth. And I, I think there has to be acknowledgments and um, I don't think we can just sweep it under the rug or skate over it real quick. I think we we have to sit with it, even though it's uncomfortable. Um, we have to be with it. Healing and education, there are these two kind of uh, partners. One of the ways we learn is by feeling safe and having connection to others. And without that feeling and that dynamic, uh, of connection and safety, how can we learn? Healing's not an easy thing. And so, you know, I think those two components are really, really important to to that to, in that journey. Yeah, as counter practices. Ryan discovered many identity stories as he walked the spiral path of his journey. He called upon the seven sacred or grandfather-grandmother teachings to guide him along the way.
As Ryan began reclaiming his cultural heritage, he was given a medicine name by a man Ryan described as being connected to spirit. This naming experience was a key moment in his identity journey. A medicine name can only be spoken in sacred ceremonies. Hearing it provided me with a lot of answers and a lot of connection. And um, it was really, it became almost like this beacon of figuring out and reconnecting to who I am. And part of that is was a, a reconnection to my culture and spirituality. Yeah. So, and you know, shortly after I received that, these things started happening. Um, you know, one of the things that you do in the residential facility is you do uh, night checks and you're opening doors and shining a flashlight, you know. And uh, for me, that was that was connected to my name and uh, uh, was really showing me that there's something to it. It was, it was like evidence that uh, there's things happening. Spiritually speaking, over time, it, it, you know, other things started to make sense about what that name meant to me and my purpose and yet my role in community. Yeah. I, I've learned this idea about the Incas recently. They were constantly changing their name throughout their life. They had many, many, many names. We are all known in the, all these different ways, how Western ways seek to nail things down. So for my entire life, my name's Ryan. The reality is many people in many different times in my life in different contexts know me in different ways. I think we're constantly growing and evolving into those things. When I learned what my medicine name was, which is my identity, I found it very free. One of the tactics of colonialism in colonial Canada was to rename Indigenous children. When they were apprehended and taken into residential schools, they changed their names. That's a desecration. What we're all talking about, like the nailing of things down, is a source of illness. I think that's what westernized psychology takes away, because whose story are we telling in these diagnostic manuals? Not only are they not from our culture of descriptions of illness, there are a group of people who decided that these are the, the categories and problems. One of the great things that narrative and Indigenous practices has for it, it is so ethical to leave it up to the experiencer to describe themselves. Narrative sovereignty. Early in Ryan's journey to reclaim his cultural heritage, he took up the role of elder's helper in sacred ceremonies. He discovered new purpose and meaning in his identity story. I was working in this wonderful program called Puna Keepers of the Fire. And I think I may have mentioned what Puna was. It's, it's uh, a word that the elders would, would call out when a ceremony needed to be held. And the youth in community understood their role and that when Puna was yelled that it was their responsibility to make fires for these ceremonies. One of the things about this program was the youth we were working with through the process of assimilation and colonialism have become disconnected from their culture, their customs, and their practices. Because of that, othering um, had lost their purpose. In helping these youth reconnect to some kind of purpose through reclamation, that happened for me as well. And that was taking up a role in a spiritual community. That was for me an elder's helper. The title that was given to the elder's helpers was Scapios preparing different things for ceremony and making sure the elders had everything they needed to run those ceremonies. And, and that had many functions for me at the time, identity, um, purpose, uh, meaning, 
And so all those things were kind of growing out of that. Yeah, did a lot of observing and listening um, and helping um, and just having that relationship with an older generation. It was, it was like an education, actually. I received this education outside of the formalities of westernized education structures. You know, and there's merit to that in indigenous cultures. I can't think of a better word right now, but that was the exchange. That was the economy. They gifted me an education and I gifted them help. I feel like one of the stages I'm at now is the creation of space and holding space for people to come to so that their truth can be heard. I think one of my responsibilities is to allow that truth to stand on its own. Opening spaces for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people that, that create safety where we can create relationships and connection. Because I, I think that's the biggest uh, counter to colonialism is good relations. You know, I was taught by elders about this thing called heart speak, allowing spirit to just flow through and, and speak what, what needs to be said, because you never know what messages people need to receive. Through our conversations, Ryan discovered a growing awareness of his relationship to fire and water. He spoke to me of having taken an oath for truth, to speak up and speak out about the truth of colonizing practices, and how he stands in the dual role of warrior and healer in his community. I recently had this wonderful conversation where I was um, shared some traditional knowledge about fire and water and it really to me related to this idea of the warrior and the healer and there's times where maybe taking a warrior approach might be too much and that maybe it requires a healer's touch so right now i'm going through a process of thinking about those kinds of things and making judgments about how my voice might come across as fire or water or the truth might come across as fire or water when i initially encountered this idea and how it fit in with the warrior and the healer was that there was a negative connotation to fire and only a positive one with water but i realized that there can be both force fire might scorch the land uh, but two you know water can do damage but both can be healing how my approach to speaking the truth using my voice for truth how i utilize that and there for sure has been times where uh it, it's more like fire and that's hot and I'm sure that there's been times where it's like water. And that could be hard to swim in as well. So I, I, now I'm starting to think about the relationship between fire and water and some of the healing ceremonies that I've uh, been blessed to experience. Ryan's story kindled memories of my time on the big island of Hawaii where Pele, the goddess of the volcano, reigns. According to tradition, she embodies the lava flow and other natural forces linked to volcanic eruptions. For many Hawaiians, Pele is ohana, or family, and is revered and celebrated. I was on a retreat with one of my teachers, Kim, and we were in Hawaii, the Kilauea caldera, erupted. We were able to get close to the lava flow. And it was one of the most, oh, I don't know, terrifying and awe-inspiring experiences in my life. 
the lava flow, it's like, like a river that flows down the side of the volcano, would hit a tree and it, the tree would explode, follow this river of lava all the way down to the edge of the island, plumes of steam shoot up out of the ocean. And little by little, that molten fire becomes a bit of the island. When it meets water, it creates land. There's where fire and water meet and create something new. First of all, thank you for sharing your data set with me. <laughs> now, now that's that's in, in here, and, and, and now I forever get to render out wisdom from that. Where you're taking me to is my experiences with the relationship of fire and water in healing ceremony. The way that you're describing this volcano, probably not the safest thing to be very close to, and probably really uncomfortable if you got close enough. And I can't imagine what it would be like to be going through that process of heating up rocks so hot that it's like a river. Isn't healing like that? When I think about the story you shared about the grandfather, grandmother, volcano, and narrative practices and ideas, transforming and growing and creating new land, exploring new territories, I mean, it's making me think about truth and reconciliation and how we're kind of expanding into new territory for the people that are authentically doing it. That's uncomfortable, it's scary. We're trying to figure things out. The structure of some indigenous communities, the warriors occupy the outside and they, and they face the outer world kind of as protectors. The inside of that space is safe space for the community, for the elders, for the mothers, and for the children. And this idea of fire and water and the healer and the warrior now comes into that and comes into focus a bit more on on how they work together i have and do occupy both spaces in my roles in community and family and for me it's actually a clarification and a validation that yes in fact i am both of those things uh, identity and role and and that they can actually function quite well together in knowing how i create these spaces on the outside protect them but on the inside provide opportunities to heal in in my culture there's um the grandfather and grandmother teachings love is one of them Traditional practices are full of love and caring. How the healer brings love in, into the lodge. How the warrior uh, helps create space for love to exist. Ryan and I discovered new possibilities for truth and reconciliation as stories transported us to reimagined landscapes of meaning. On July 25, 2022, Pope Francis apologized for the role of the Catholic Church in the cultural destruction and forced assimilation of indigenous peoples in Canada, including the harm done to children in residential schools. I was curious about Ryan's response to this public acknowledgement. Although I do think it is important that there are these acknowledgements and apologies and things like that, uh, I do sometimes wonder about the background and the behind the scenes. You know, I'm aware that these things often have agendas and other motivations. My, my fear is, is that it's used as a political prop Say, hey, you know, like there's been an apology. Let's move on with reconciliation. But why are we still harping on this? Unfortunately, it validates that the broader public is quite unaware 
fairly insensitive to what, what's going on. This conversation with Ryan reminded me of my early recovery experience in 12-step programs. I discovered that making amends was more than simply apologizing to those I had harmed when I was misusing alcohol and drugs. It was a key part of my spiritual journey during which I made a commitment to honest self-reflection and being more ethical in all my relationships. My story about making amends connected Ryan to his understanding of reconciliation. I'm thinking about this idea of reconciliation and how it kind of assumes or presumes or um, implies or suggests, I'm not sure which one, maybe all those things, that there was once a functional relationship between Indigenous people and uh, the colonial structures that were settling these, or colonizing these territories. I don't think that there ever was. And so reconciliation suggests, hey, let's go back to that one functional relationship. But if there wasn't, what are we doing? It's not a reconciliation. And so this idea of making amends makes a lot more sense to me. Canadians who are of uh, Euro-European descent, I think, have to reconcile the truth for themselves. Some of that, I think, is just making amends. Maybe it should be truth in making amends. <laughs> really? In terms of my own story and the 12 steps, before you get to the hard part about making amends, you have to write a fearless moral inventory and a list of people you've harmed. I needed a circle. Yeah. I needed a spiritual holding space so I could face the feelings of shame and remorse that showed up. First impulse is often to just to totally run away from those feelings and, and defend yeah. and say, yeah. oh, it wasn't really my fault. I think what you're describing is the process that maybe a lot of non-Indigenous people might have. It's almost like a blueprint or a, a map of the things that one might experience in genuinely going through a process of reconciling that truth. It seems to me the things I've witnessed in the authentic allies that I have in my life. And it seems to be something missing from a lot of people, because you're right, like, you know, the sentiment with the post-apology that um, not not the whole thing, not everyone, but, you know, get over this. Um, you know, I didn't do this stuff. It was my ancestors. You can't hold me accountable for that. That's not fair. Um, you know, that that's all those are all those defenses that you're talking about. Yeah. When I hear some of these words about coming together and commonality, um common understanding. Um, the the word that keeps coming up for me over and over again is rhythm. You know, like the tides, like breathing, like walking, like drumming. There's a rhythm, and I think there's a rhythm in reconciliation, the back and forth, uh, reciprocity, and through acknowledging truth first, reconciliation is this rhythm. You know, I, I think what we're experiencing in that rhythm um, is this interconnectedness. We're all in relation. Yeah. And and how do we how do we come together and, and regain our rhythms with each other? Western culture, elders' stories are often rendered invisible 
as many are warehoused and disconnected from family, their wisdom lost to future generations. Ryan often spoke of the ways his people honor elders and how their stories offered him ways to reconnect with his heritage. Our conversations awakened my curiosity about how some of us were stepping into eldership. Several years ago, Ryan asked Don to mentor him in narrative practices. In the tradition of Ryan's people, he honored Don with a gift. Don, what was it like for you to be invited uh, to a kind of uh, mentorship or uh, so-called supervision or whatever we call this uh, in such a, a ceremonial and sacred way? A, a very humbling. Mm. It was re really humbling. It's, I'm an elder. And he never pointed that out, out to me. Mm. But um, as time went on, I realized that um, you know, being an elder, uh, there's uh, certain uh, ways of interacting. <laughs> My Western part of me didn't want to really actually be. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't feel that old. Uh, I don't like the term senior. And um, so, um, <laughs> you know, it was, yeah, this came through the door. Hmm. Uh, months later, and um, it was a drum that his father had made. In true Western fashion, I was just so, oh, no, 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 don't, no, <laughs> uh, no, no, which is so rude. <laughs> Not rude, but it's just so, so Western. <laughs> so Euro-Canadian or Euro-American or mm -hmm. whatever whatever label you want you know and that and um uh, so I, I i you know after that scene <laughs> i um i accepted it with great great honor if he eagerly stepped into her role at the gathering as chef and sage chelsea josh and others took up the role of elder's helper. She told me about her experience of eldership and shared stories about the elders who cared for her as a child. It's a way to share wisdom. It's a way to be present in the world. It's a way to uh, kind of honor, you know, the life that we've all lived. That's all for somebody else, but for me, for me in particular, it's a, I finally made it. I made it. I would never thought I would make it, but I have. I made it and I'm able to say I'm old. And I'm able to say I passed the test. I reached the milestones. I've done it. And that I'm going to be more of myself because that's what there is, is more of me all the time. And I seem to be in, in terms of being an elder. Um, stretching and growing more out of myself, which is a wonderful experience. I think that there are gifts that we can bring to the table youth can't, and I'm very pleased to do that. I'm very, very pleased to offer it up. You know, and I'm looking more and more at the young people around me and finding people who are interested in how it is we can move forward with our lives and how um, we can go ahead and show others that there's a great deal to be learned for living hard and living through really difficult experiences. Ryan was talking about his relationship with the elders of his community, and I was wondering if that struck a chord with you. I think it, it does strike a chord with me because I come from... Um, I may be the last of my generation that comes from a group of elders that passed on their wisdom. Ify, tell me the story about your aunt. What was her name? Angeliki, which is Angelica. This is a Greek household. You know, this is Thea Angeliki, or Yaya, Yaya Kiki, what the little kids used to call her. But Thea Angeliki is what I called. She was my Thea. 
She was my grandfather's sister. One of the things that I remembered about her was her ability to teach and her ability to love and her ability to do it in a way that um, a child did not feel criticized, that she didn't um, she didn't scowl. She didn't, and if you didn't do something right, she didn't get all upset. She just had to do it again. It was very Montessori. You just did it again, you know, until it was right. And then she was smiling and then the child's smiling and everyone's happy, right? And one of the things she taught me how to do was to, how to make a bed. I mean, I was only five years old, so it's like five and six. I was... Um, making my bed and my bed was a little it was a small bed tucked into a little room next to hers and she would teach me how to put the sheets on and how to pull them taut and smooth out any wrinkles and the smoothing out was the the wrinkles are called zarus zarus so you smooth the zarus out for me, it's it's not so much the sense of smoothing. It's doing things correctly. It's learning how to do things so that they're beautiful. It's doing things in a rhythm and doing things in the correct order. Were home and church important to you and your elders? Yes, absolutely. In fact, when you're when you're uh, growing up, I mean that's one of the things that. My father used to say, the things that are the most important are God, your spirituality, your home and family, and your education. We were at the church all the time. I used to, there's a man called uh, Jacobus, who is the Archbishop of North and South America. I used to sit on his lap while he did notes and eat strawberries, <laughs> while my aunt used to run his errands. <laughs> I was all over the church. I loved the church. I loved it. I loved the sounds. I loved the smells. I loved the bells. I love. I love the spiritual feeling. I still do. I have that feeling. I don't necessarily practice that religion, but that spirit place is very easy for me to get to and reach to. My grandfather adopted me. My grandfather's wife couldn't raise me couldn't take care of me what i call now in this life i'm in the holy trinity the three women who were my grandfather's sisters who were responsible for you know saving this child and bringing her to uh, you know into being a human being i think for 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 myself to be able to be in a circle of healing um was not as a, an adult, but as a child. And without that safety of those elders, I would have died. I would have died. And, and my soul would have been crushed. So I owe them a great deal. When the elders um, begin to die, begin to, to leave us and transcend, that there's a vacuum. And there's a scurrying to remember all of the things that they would taught us. There's a scurrying to remember how they held us. Um, I am lucky in that in my family, it was the elders that took me on when my own uh, parents couldn't. Mm -hmm. That it was the elders that gave us safe haven, the elders that gave us a place to enjoy being and really allowed children to be children, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing. I'm the oldest of the people left. Mm -hmm. So now it's my job, as I take it, um, to do the same thing with my grandchildren and, and their children. So it's been a delightful process to pass that on, to really make St. Pagan. And you passed the test, if you made it. I made it. <laughs> you know, when when we were talking about that transition to the unknown not being so scary, I started experiencing that when I was able to take 
that that safety that I get in ceremony and circle outside that and that life was kind of sacred and my journey was kind of sacred and oh that you know I'm safe generally I mean things happen in life but I, I'm I'm safe and and I can I can enjoy my experiences whether they're positive or negative and, and that for me was the the shift rather than always living in fear about stuff and judgment or fear of judgment yeah 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 that's a oh, that's that's really close for me too yeah that yeah what is that difference between the adventure and the fear yeah oh that's really good yeah that's, that's yeah that and, and again what are we what are we coming out of when we're stepping into non-knowing as an adventure, as a, a journey into eldership or something else? Uh, yeah, I, uh, that's a different way of being. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's honoring the sacredness of life itself. Yeah. Being present with ourselves and others is essential to our stories of identity as narrative practitioners, warriors, healers, and holders of sacred spaces. During the gathering, Josh invited us into a conversation on the qualities of presence. Arlene offered an opportunity to be present with ourselves through writing. We wrote the stories of our names. We played with metaphors and created a collaborative poem of simple joys. Poetry is another kind of storytelling that engages the imagination through metaphor and imagery. Our poet laureate Pam gifted us with verse that emerged from a writing prompt. It feels like the answer has always been inside of me just waiting to be asked this question. <laughs> it's really very different. It's interesting. Where I'm from. If you get to choose to describe where you are from, that gives you a base that sort of multiplies because where I'm from is steady and it can change. I am fromming from all sorts of places, events, ideas, and thoughts. All the time, they claim me. I come from multitudes. I am from where I situate my from at this time which doesn't negate other threads of from, discovered from the chair I sit in, from the dark hallway, the open field, that piece of song from the grandfather I never met, from the next place I am going, from somewhere and everywhere, with stops in between. I am from your thoughts of fromness. I am from Fromville, North Central Fromville. I speak with a from accent, from here to there and eternity, from the gentle shores and lemonade doors, the games of jacks hiding behind the garage, the tea tray, the afternoon walk, the iron laces of thought. I am from going to the next from with my from suitcase, packed with from pajamas, crammed in beside from socks and from sweaters, from alpacas and lambs. I will from all the way to a near star, from the outside in, from the ancient past to the ancient future, from downtown from town, from rocks and weeds, from my near breath. Do you want anything else? <laughs> I'm frummed out. <laughs> we shared many kinds of stories in the Sacred Lodge that connected us to each other and the web of life in rich and unexpected ways. This animated version of One I Told opens up possibilities of what can happen when we recognize kinship. The Bridge Story by Patricia Burke Animation by McKenna Schwab
there was a bridge, old as the stars. It spanned a deep chasm, deeper than the cleft of the world. If one stood at its midpoint and looked down, the river below appeared as if it were a single black thread, curled and twisting, from one edge of a matchbox to the other. Redwood slats, milled by hand, were tightly strung two by two, and suspended securely from a web of rope. They were the bones of the connection between two disparate worlds, Eastern Pinnacle and the Great Western Valley. Whoever wished to pass from one side to the other, and there were few who dared, must trod those wooden slats, and sway with the wild wind. Two young samurai, already tested in battle, were girded with steel, and clothed in royal garb, from families of rare and mysterious lineage. They set forth one day, one from the east, the other from the west, to seat themselves in high places. After much travail they happened upon the rock-strewn pass, on either side of the jagged cliffs, whose juncture was the wooden bridge. Spying each other from abroad, both stood motionless at the boundaries of their own lands. Their garb was unfamiliar to each other. The warriors unsheathed their weapons, and raised them overhead, fiercely clasping elegantly carved hilts. One of jade, the other milky pearl. The fire of battle, was in their eyes, before either samurai could move. A red ball rolled quickly, and with great purpose, over the rough slats, as if this small sphere, were the sun compelling the earth to follow its true orbit. Then two children, one dressed in yellow, the other in green, chased their own laughter across the great divide, in eager pursuit of the round. The warriors, taken out of time into a space beyond words, lowered their swords, walked slowly towards one another, then, reaching the midpoint of gathered planks, paused. The warrior from Eastern Pinnacle spoke. In breath, the word is life. Brother, I see it in your eyes. You are my twin, separated from me at birth, when our real parents, forsaken and impoverished, abandoned us to the wind. I have been searching for you since I learned of our fate. I see you also found refuge in a royal house. The other reached out and said, Brother, I see you as well. We are reunited at last. The young warriors, hurled their great curved swords into the ravine, then embraced as only brothers can. Tears flowing from their eyes filled the immense chasm below. Suddenly the river roared, and swirled beneath them, the fluid waters giving life to new beginnings, striving upward toward the bridge. Laughter filled the land. All the people from Eastern Pinnacle and the Great Western Valley, swarmed the banks of this new flow. They flung rafts and small boats with sails into the deep water, freely crossing from one side to the other, waving and calling out, Hello! The brothers, still entwined, watched with delight as the river rose beyond the wooden slats, drawing them deeply into the current. The ancient bridge was consumed by the sheer force of the flow, and was silently washed away. On the last evening of the gathering, the circle reconvened to honor Abby. While sitting around the fire, the stranger entered the picture. Like the Incas, he had many names, including drifter, seeker, messenger, guest, witness, wrinkle, man with light behind him, and Jared. Both fire and water medicine showed up at the breakfast table conversation the next morning. It was fun having all of this mentorship and all of these very beautiful things said. Um, but of course, the the thing that kind of threw everyone off is while we were having this very powerful moment that I think everyone felt the power of not just me who you know was being honored a man started walking in some of us could see him like a long way off but all of a sudden there was just like a man with light behind him walking toward us he came up and I think everyone kind of activated in different ways 
for me, I was just trying to figure out like what he needed, what he wanted, like what drew him to us. So we kind of explained a little bit of what we were doing because I feel like passing around a, a piece of wood and then talking about one person over a fire and all of that might seem kind of interesting. So without like sharing too much, we kind of let him know what was going on and then completed the ceremony where, you know, we were honoring me. But then it just kind of like took this very unique turn where we started sharing more about who we were and what we were doing, not unlike mystical, magical, fictional things that I read something about what we were doing in the beauty and power and just light to us drew him to the fire that night. I do believe there's power to the goodness and light and love and respect that we all have in us and that collectively I think is really undeniable. I think someone that maybe was in need of that would have a really hard time not coming to us and being drawn and being touched by just the light that we were creating. I would like to call him something beside his name, Jared, because he's special to us in some way now. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, it's not an interruptive. It's not that idea. Unexpected, maybe. That's a better word. Told you it's that unexpected. Oh, yeah. And that, that sense that hey, something happened here. Yeah. It's right, okay. And something did happen. Well, there was this yeah. moment that um, Abby, after the civil was leaning forward in her chair. And uh, Caitlin, uh, across from her, was leaning forward in her chair. Mm -hmm. And they had both become lions. Right, right, right. Those are delights. Within their own individual metaphor. In their own, their own, and from completely different spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was like, and I just kind of look over to uh, Ryan, and he's like, he's like, you know, like, wow. <laughs> and and I was there, and I saying, wow, you know. And I thought, well, we're not different in any way. You know, we're both just in wow right now. I'm in so he's way. not outside <laughs> and he's not inside, but he's now part of that circle of honoring. I was trying to find ways to, to kind of figure out how to uh, safely and appropriately handle what was happening because, and, and I didn't have that full experience. So I drew from a few things and I quickly got answers from the indigenous stuff and, and from the narrative stuff. And you know that, that that witnessing made sense for me from the from the narrative stuff and uh figuring out how to incorporate that into the ceremonial piece, but keeping that whole my traditional territory isn't these territories. I'm Western. And I wonder if there needed to be a witness from this territory. And he's got these connections yes, yes. traditionally, and and Abby's journey with her indigenousness maybe needed a witness. That was one of the things that I we related on is this journey of uh, reclamation mm -hmm. with that indigeneity. Yeah, and and that was that's something for her. And there he is. You know, we had been talking uh, at different points about the opening, right? The open mm -hmm. door, the the what we represent as individually ourselves, but a new other person who opens yes. the door, right? So, and the light. And the light. So, yeah. You open oh, the door. Huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, yeah. Right? And then as soon as he said, I felt the opening. Yes. He mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was, those that's yeah. what, it, and I had talked about opening, and we had talked about open time, mm -hmm. and that's when I looked at you, and you were like glowy, you know? <laughs> All right, you were for me. You were like, Whoa. <laughs> so it's like that. Like there's the light. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was like so. You know what we we don't know in our best intentions what we and what we invite in, mm -hmm. and how we treat that guest. Yeah, at the table mm -hmm. really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. It sure. really does. Can you talk about your wolf last night? 
Now you go ahead and do it was natural. Right. What I'm asking now is, is there a lesson? Because we talked about, we have all these days of talking about othering and colonizing. And I invite this guy in our circle. And then afterwards, I'm like, is he dangerous? I, mean, I don't want to other this guy, right? So that was my point. But, yeah. but then in this conversation, um, some, some, I, I forget exactly what you said, uh, but basically it brought me to the story. Like, like you said, like something like you were protecting your the group, you were protecting people. And I was like, God damn, that's the wolf. Like, yes. the, wolf story, <laughs> the wolf nudges people and watches out for the pack, right? Like that was right. in the story. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. like, the wolf is like nudging people together and watching out. And, you know, can you sense that the wolf is kind of got your back? the old uh, army engineer will like come in and, and I had to say like, well, 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 well. just <laughs> slow it's down. That's not necessarily the yeah. place for that. That, that, was, yeah. that was the, that was the, the warrior. Like the warrior. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. witnessed the warrior and everybody. Like, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, ready to go. You know, yeah. Just in case. Yeah. 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 And it, and it came up automatically and then, and then, then it eased. Yeah, yeah. And, and you have to. Things and I think. Same time. Yeah, and I think part of it is that we had to hold those different experiences very lightly, so that we could experience the spirit coming in yeah. and yeah. telling us, "Well, it's like this is what's happening. It's happening. It's not this that's happening, or yeah. this is happening. It's it's this, and you need to open your door." He openly said, the last one, he actually said, but well, you're a wrinkle. If someone had called me a wrinkle, I would have been like, okay, it's time for me to, to back away, to realize I'm outside and I, I don't want to care. But he didn't do that because he had a, I mean, I had a sense that he had a feeling that Somehow unconnected to this. How does Ryan have the wisdom to call him a wrinkle? But it was a wrinkle. And what he said was not so much your wrinkle. He said, This is a wrinkle. Yes. Since a wrinkle is a problem. And he said, Let's let's move it. And I'm going to go exotic. Yes. Because here we can talk about it, and and we can be with it, and even me who wasn't there, but um, he was there, and imagine what happened to this man. Well, that's what we would. Yeah. Well, circle back eh? as everyone was leaving. Yeah. He had he'd been one of the first to leave. Yeah. And we were kind of I was gathering my things, and and there was other kind of thing. Me and Roger were cleaning up and putting the fires out and all that kind of stuff. And then I was kind of out there by myself, making sure I had all my things. And then all of a sudden, Jared's right there. <laughs> and I was like, right? And then and, and Roger noticed and some of the other people in the house noticed and they were worried about my safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and so, but he, he came over to express his gratitude about this experience. So he, in some ways, did get a bit of a de debriefing. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, he was talking about how that was such an impactful experience for him and like he was kind of expressing that's what he needed. I, I asked him some questions because he had mentioned that he had distant family in in, in New Brunswick. Most stock territory, New Brunswick, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're not really connected. But I could hear in his voice that New Brunswick accent yeah, is yeah. very indigenous out there. And uh, I was like, there is definitely something more to what's going on here. Yeah. But one of the things Chelsea told me this morning, because she was completely <laughs> not physically connected to everything, she was saying, I, I had this image of a bear kind of lumbering down to this fire. That's and so right. that, and that's one of the things about the Wolfstock territory right. is the bear. Yeah. Wolfstock and the Brunswick is the bear. We were talking about this last night, Kathy and I, when we got back to the hotel, it was like, if you have a knowing and you're in this world alone by yourself and you have a knowing or a, or a a sense yeah. that like things in this society yeah. are kind of weird, but you're you're trying to make it by yourself in the society with this no doubt. And then you walk and you find a magic stream 
of course you want to drink of this magic dream. You want it like like I was like miracles happened last night. That was crazy. Like to watch this whole thing unfold. Like, but like I would I wouldn't be able to stop drinking of the stream. I would be like, oh my God, if if I leave without coming back and saying just one last thing, I'm gonna regret it for the rest of my experience. What we have found in these narrative groups, or at least what I have found in this narrative group, is a space of belonging and of knowing. And what do we do with that in this weird world that we have, we are subject to? You know, how do we make our own space? How do we create our magic streams so that we can drink of them? And I think it's this community that we've created. There's so much safety here um, in in this space. And we have got miracles in, in all the in-between spaces with one another. Um, and even in the direct spaces, not just in the in-between spaces. So, so like, I can understand if I just found a magic stream, like, how do I let this go? Like, I would need to have to come back and just say at least a thank you. Each day of the gathering, we returned again and again to the spiral. Each sunrise and sunset brought new understandings and awareness. The closing ceremony completed the circle, where there really is no beginning and no ending, but a continuous movement through opening time and a symbol of our connection with all beings. Ryan invited us to paint a tree of life on a canvas he had prepared. We pressed a fingerprint of paint on each tree a reminder of community and the magic of the stories we shared. Later, Ryan and I found a spot in the yard that called to me. There was a pile of stones of different shapes and sizes. Ryan placed tobacco on a stone as an offering to spirit to hold us in loving awareness and guide us into the partnership of naming and producing the documentary film that doesn't document. Ken often spoke of opening time in the animate world. The idea that stories are alive, that we stand on new ground every time we tell and retell our stories of lived experience. In opening time, the real effects of storytelling are felt in the past, present, and future. Several weeks after the narrative gathering at Dawnland, we met again to share stories about how the experience was rippling through our lives in opening time. Although the conversation was virtual, the physical distance between us melted into a sense of presence. I have to say, I hadn't realized it before, but you know what that looks to me like on the, on the screen? What? It looks like a Christmas tree. So this is crazy. So some of the first medicine I ever picked was from a Christmas tree. You know, we bring a Christmas tree in because we're honoring, you know, Earth and Mother Earth. Long, long time ago before we actually celebrated Christmas. And then I'm learning about medicines and stuff. And I'm sitting here looking at this Christmas tree. And I'm like, well, this is so symbolic of like family getting together and being with one another. And so I have this jar of pine needles from like that I use as medicine. And my smudging and stuff. So, wow. Okay. There's an interesting story here. One of the First Nations people, peoples that they, um, where a, a stranger arrives uh, at a um, a family's tent and is taken in and shown some hospitality, and they notice the next morning that the stranger is gone has disappeared but they they find tracks in the snow and as they they follow the tracks in the snow they come to what some of us would consider a christmas tree but the the tree is covered in different types of gifts it seems like during the gathering during the camp we talked quite a bit about trees like it was brought up about uh wizard of oz the the uh the trees throwing the apples <laughs> um i also had another wizard of oz story that was in the story return to oz where they have the lunch pail trees 
Like these are, these just aren't any other fruit, but you crack them open and there's so much nourishment inside. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a gift. Brian, I do have this experience of some of the things you said and the silence that followed after was two way. We, you know, we, were, we were connected and we weren't connected in any, um, if you call it physical, meaning sound, we weren't talking. We weren't gesturing. We were responding, resonating. I don't know what it is. But where I got to rippling in time was it brought me back to that sense of connectedness that I didn't have to be with everybody physically. This group here that we're, we're talking now, I've been feeling connected, you know, in that way much more. Again, that's why I love these retreats and I love all these sessions and even in zoom it, it's not you know we're not physically together but there's there's a feeling that somehow it feels very akin to the feeling of those silences those silent responses prior to talking i'm just sitting here so my mind is like this happy puppy and it's bouncing from box to box to box oh yes oh yes, 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 yes. so i'm just sitting here it's like Grace, so well, I can't slow this thing down. As we're speaking, I'm forgiving myself for my busy mind and my my uh, jumping ahead too much that my mind always does because my mind is always 50 yards down the road. <laughs> you know, actually at the same time as my mind is all over the place, jumping from box to box and just like panting all over each of you. <laughs> you know, my heart is pretty steady. And my heart is just feeling it and, and my spirit feels it. Ryan, I was thinking about the difference between the that beautiful opening ceremony that, that I experienced with you leading it and with this group. And I mean, I've participated in drum circles and some other things. And um, there's a different sacredness for me. There was a different sacredness there. And I can't put that, I don't, I don't even want to try to put words on that. You know, uh, I just want to let that keep rippling inside into my heart and my spirit because that that rippling in the heart and spirit is kind of where I like to live. You know, Grace, my elders teach me that the journey of life is from here to here and back. Uh -huh. It seems to be that that there's this relationship between your head and your heart that maybe when you're younger you don't have, or maybe when you're really young you have. And then you lose it along the way. It's you're, it's programmed out, and then you have to reprogram yourself. And that's what that is. As I'm saying it out loud right now. Many years ago in um, Australia, I was at a narrative conference in Adelaide. the The whole thing was was pretty overwhelming. Flora Tuahaka and um, some other. People were presenting on just therapy, not not just like merely, but just as in uh, correct or or moral. When that was over, I was walking uh, in these beautiful grounds to the next workshop I was going to, and I felt my heart coming out of my body, and my heart was really coming out of my body so strongly and physically that I um, <laughs> I lay down on the ground uh, face first to keep my heart from actually falling out. I didn't care that this must have looked very strange <laughs> to other people because I was I was keeping my heart in my body and that was really an important thing. My heart felt secure in my body, but it was also a bigger heart and I could feel it um, stretching in there um but it was okay because it was secure so i could you know i could get up you know instead of put face plant on the ground you know i could get up and sort of sit up and then i could you know get up and keep walking and um later on that day um i asked kiwi thomas Sacy because she was the only one there who had been at that workshop if i could you know tell her what what had happened she said um, you, you actually have a new heart and it's a better heart. Mm. 
really moved to add because my experiences kept happening after, and I think maybe in some form we're talking about it. So I, I got up to work on on the Monday this last Monday, and things were kind of happening and stuff. And I ended up at this youth group, which I didn't know was faith based. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, um, and I and I'm not too into scripture, but I've been moved by it at times. <clears throat> My my faith is really land based. At the end of this thing, there's there's like you know 14 little indigenous kids all gathered around this food outside by an outdoor fire pit, very rustic. And these two people, one of them's a teacher, uh, and you know was trying to explain these two scriptures. And you know these kids are like in grade, you know there's a couple grade four students and you know the rest of them are kind of like grade one two and three and maybe not understanding of what he was explaining that's just the context but then these two pieces of scripture that he wrote down it's from possums and it's about david uh and his time in the desert and one of the words in it was a parched land and then his wife was kind of speaking while he was struggling to explain this And she talked about a discouraged spirit. And it was like something clicked in me. I have this parched land spirit. And I needed this connection. Mm -hmm. And so what David was talking about is is how his relationship with Jesus is like water and hydrating the parched land. And I'm like, okay, wow, I'm, I'm receiving things in ways that maybe I hadn't been open to before. So like this whole expandedness and Mm. Pam, when you're talking about having this heart transplant and things like that, that's, that's speaking to me about what's happening in my life Mm -hmm. and I'm learning about it in different ways. And so, you know, heart transplant, parts, land, water and words. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All the ways we can love each other. Yeah. I'm changed. Uh, And I wasn't expecting that. I'm so grateful that I could fall in love with a group of people the way that this has happened. I'm sort of fascinated uh, with uh, the words showing up uh, and uh, not being there uh, until they show up. But I'm also fascinated with how they showed up in your work style for me, and how those words, when I go back to them, they make me cry again. (laughs) And I'm really interested in that. I don't know what I'm asking you about. But what is your thoughts about just that idea of the written word showing up, and then you can go back to those words? It just kind of opens the door. Mm-hmm. gives an opportunity to look at yourself instead of, you know, always, you know, panning for gold with others. I had the experience that I didn't do it. It did it to me. I have to say, Arlene, I'm now having this image of... Uh, individually us panning for gold on a parched land and and now there's water and what's left in your pan when you look down what's in there water you know the, the real gold is the water when i got home I had all these wonderful experiences and my son was like, oh, let's do the cards. 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 I was like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> and um, so we, we have these like kind of Oracle spirit cards. And so we pulled a bunch out and we did the readings of them, but I pulled one, a spider. And um, it reminded me of uh, some of the stories that were shared with me about the spider and the spider web. The spider saw that, you know, humans were becoming more and more complex and needed ways to express it. The people started to see symbols in the spider web. Mm. And that's what makes up the alphabet is these symbols that the people saw. Talk about weaving a web. There was a time where we didn't need to 
have such complex expression. Mm. It, it was just more holistic. You know, when you look at petroglyphs and pictographs, it's a different, it's more visual, it's more imagery. What we're talking about is taking me to that. And this other construct or idea that was shared with me by a researcher, because I was being asked all kinds of questions and I was wrestling with them and struggling with them. And I was trying to share some of these ideas about indigenous worldview and perspectives and, and how I relate to it and community and things like that. This researcher shared with me this artist who shared when two colors meet, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a clean line. It's, it's not a, like a separation. It's like this blending. The space between me and you isn't clearly cut. It, it's, it's this kind of interwoven, inter kind of connection, you know, spiritually speaking, you know. There seems to be our mind has created all these separations with things, but the reality is it, it's, it's more kind of like this, whatever this is. And, and there's lots that happens in there. When people were talking, it made me um, have a new image for what happened to me. Bigness is always a part of my life. I don't think that I've been able to do many things without bigness. The image of water came through of like jumping off a cliff and diving into the water and bringing all of me into that space. All of these, these pieces that I'm not in love with about myself what they became actually are were big big openings for me like a, being able to break open a rock a bit and get out more of these pieces that i'm ready to let go of hardness barnacles anger to be able to get them to the soft baby whale space that Kathy and i spoke a lot about at first i was horrified now i'm like so thankful for all of them showing up in the way that they did because they allowed me to I think see them walk around them and then find the opening into the love space with them and Friday after this when I went to the beach I knew I needed to get into this freezing cold water that nobody else was in and I knew I needed to like submerge my head I made myself do it it was so cold and I was so feeling like that baby whale needed to be baptized and needed to be baptized in my own religion and um it needed to be baptized in the spirit of love this idea of love has come up lots since uh, our time together i don't know if it's an acceptance or a forgiveness or a letting go one of the experiences we had is I was pretty stressed about going back across the border because I had I brought this feather with me and I wasn't sure that the U.S. Customs handled it properly. And so I have this feather trying to go across the border, which is, you know, it's a pretty serious deal if you're not a First Nations person and don't handle it properly. So we're sitting there waiting at the Callis border between Callis and St. Stephen. And there's this eagle there. And it's it's flying around between Canada and the U S as if to kind of say like, see, I can go back and forth without having to check in with anyone. You know, why don't you relax a little man? Um, and the only thing that I could come up with that made any sense to me was that acting in love and not fear and not being threatened. It was, you know, different. And I think that that was something that got healed in time because of all you. Because we each kind of, like on that drum, we each have that lace to pull to make the right sound. And that happened. Our Teoshpai, our spirit family, made the right drum sound, the right resonance because we were open to this.
In our conversations during and after the gathering at Dawnland, we discovered that healing requires the holding space of a circle of love. In this space, we can stand up for truth, open to vulnerability, and make amends. We also discovered that when people of different cultures and faith traditions gather in the spirit of curiosity, openness, and deep listening, it is possible to bridge any divide and become a community of sacred relations. As we came together in the circle, lines of demarcation blurred. We were moved by a deep sense of belonging and the true spirit of reconciliation.